Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we speak with Mary Olson. She is director of the Southeast Office of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NEARS. We talk about how radiation has been proven to have a greater negative impact on females, both adult women and young girls, than on males. We'll also have our regular numbnuts of the week, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Duck, and cover report, activist shout-outs, and more nuclear information than Governor Jay Nixon of Missouri wants to hear, or wants you to hear either. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, November 10, 2015, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting off in the U.S., where we have such a bad piece of news. The Obama administration on November 6th held a summit attended by nuclear industry executives, scientists, and federal regulators where it stressed the importance of nuclear power as a way to combat climate change and announced additional policies to spur investments in new types of nuclear reactors. Gack! This is based on the nuclear industry's PR lie that nuclear reactors are clean, green, and sustainable. When the only thing green about them is the glow that comes off the radiation, and the only thing sustainable about them is the amount of waste they have and how long it remains deadly from radiation. Be that as it may... The summit at the White House coincided with an announcement by the U.S. Department of Energy that it is establishing a new initiative called the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear. This is for nuclear technology developers and others in that industry who want to tap into Department of Energy expertise. That's right, our government, our tax dollars going to support more nukes. The initiative's goal is to, quote, provide the nuclear industry community with access to the technical, regulatory, and financial support necessary to move new or advanced nuclear reactor designs towards commercialization while ensuring a continued safe, I would put that in quotes, safe, reliable, and economic operation of the existing nuclear fleet, end quote. The existing nuclear fleet is for the most part verging on or going over beyond 40 years of operation, which is how long they were designed to operate before being shut down forever. Many of them have received 20-year extensions, which means they can run for 60 years. Think of a 40-year-old car and trusting it for 20 more years. And even worse... The Obama administration has pledged to supplement its $12.5 billion loan guarantee program to the nuclear industry to build more nukes under the Environmental Protection Agency's Clean Power Plan. There's so much wrong with that phrase. They are treating nuclear like a zero-carbon resource, when, of course, Radioactive waste may be carbon neutral, but it sure isn't neutral when it comes to the damage it does for our health for thousands and tens of thousands of years. There will be commentary on this in today's final thought, along with the relevance of what's going on in the White House to what's going on at Westlake in St. Louis. Meanwhile, at the state-owned radioactive waste dump at U.S. Ecology near Beatty in Nevada, less than 110 miles away from Las Vegas, whatever caught fire on Sunday, October 18, packed a powerful punch, according to Fire Marshal Chief Peter Mulvihill. He said that in the early stages of the fire, quote, there was some energetic burning. That's Fed speak for explosion. But be that as it may, energetic burning that blew a hole in the cover soil that caps the trench where low-level radioactive materials were buried in an unlined clay terrain in the 1970s. The fire that resulted prompted authorities to shut down a 140-mile stretch of U.S. Highway 95 for nearly 24 hours. 
For 30 years, from 1962 through 1992, the dump, operated by U.S. Ecology and its predecessor, Nuclear Engineering Company, on state land leased to the companies, was one of the few graveyards in the United States for disposing of low-level nuclear waste. But the ghosts, ghouls, and zombies buried in that nuclear graveyard have risen to haunt us yet again. Preliminary results from the state's radiation control program state that there is nothing in the fire's plume that was radioactive based on negative results for gamma rays. But they did not test for either alpha or beta. Meanwhile, they're going to be doing ground testing for beta and alpha particles, but I guess they're not looking for gamma on the ground. Makes me wonder if it might be a loophole, or at least a blind spot. In California, on Monday, October 26th, a state judge recommended that Southern California Edison, operators of the now-closed San Onofre Nuclear Power Facility, pay nearly $17 million as a penalty for engaging in improper talks with regulators. The judge found that Edison officials held eight unreported improper communications with one or more agency commissioners during that time. Sounds pretty innocent and maybe just a tad clumsy until you realize that one of those meetings took place in Warsaw, Poland. And, oops, they misplaced the minutes. This fine, which of course will be challenged, is merely a drop in the bucket for Edison, which, like the Broadway producer in The Producers, stands to make more money out of the closed reactor than they would have out of one that was operating that they had to keep maintaining and fixing. In Carlsbad, New Mexico, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, is back in the news. This is the deep geologic repository intended to dispose of transuranic waste from research and production of nuclear weapons. It was supposed to hold this waste safely for 10,000 years, but it imploded 9,985 years ahead of schedule when on Valentine's Day, February 14 of 2014, there was an energetic burning event that breached containment of one of the 55-gallon drums of plutonium-contaminated nuclear weapons waste from Los Alamos National Laboratory. The accident released high levels of radiation, including plutonium and americium, contaminating 8,000 feet of the underground. And even worse, some of this radioactive material made its way out into the environment. Now, a federal report suggests that operations at WIP were rushed as regards the reopening, with management focused on meeting the reopening date more than on doing things correctly. After all, what could go wrong? And even though it's been six months since the Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratory, WIP, and the New Mexico Environmental Department and the U.S. Department of Energy reached a $73 million settlement over permit violations that took place, the deal has yet to be signed. And, of course, that means no money has changed hands. Department of Energy said in an emailed statement that it continues to have very productive conversations with the state of New Mexico. We look forward to finalizing this agreement in the near future. Please define near future, and not in atomic terms, human terms. As for getting your money, good luck, New Mexico. And now it's time for the nuclear hot seat, duck, <laughs> and cover report, where we look at what's happening with nuclear reactors and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Millstone Nuclear Facility in Connecticut is on hot standby because on November 8th, a decreasing oil level in a reactor coolant pump caused a manual reactor trip to be initiated. <coughs> on October 22nd, the NRC approved an operating license for the second reactor at Watts Bar, nearly 43 years after the regulatory agency first granted a construction permit for work to begin on the nuclear plant near Spring City, Tennessee. It's being touted as the first new U.S. reactor in 19 years, but it begs the point because what really was approved was a design for a reactor that was old 40 years ago when this process started. 
Also curious in this scenario is the fact that the license to operate was approved by the commissioners before the final testing took place at the reactor. I guess they must be psychic. <laughs> Beyond Nuclear has published an analysis of the safety risks associated with the severe, ever-worsening cracking of the Davis-Bessey Atomic Reactor's containment shield building. This analysis comes out at the same time that the NRC's Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards is considering First Energy Nuclear's operating company's application for a 20-year license extension at davis Bessey in Ohio, which will have the facility operating through 2037, they hope. The analysis written by Beyond Nuclear's radioactive waste watchdog, Kevin Camps, and entitled Faustian Fission, argues that forcing ratepayers to fork over billions of dollars in bailouts to First Energy to subsidize 20 more years of radioactive Russian roulette on the Great Lakes shoreline is an outrage that must be stopped. We will have a link up to the full document on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 229. And U.S. Senator Edward Markey of Massachusetts, a member of the Environmental and Public Works Committee, has asked the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for information about the reliability and safety of nuclear power plants nationwide in extreme weather events. As an example, Markey cited the January 2015 storm that caused Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station to shut down for 12 days and the decision to shut the plant down again in February because of blizzard forecasts. Other extreme weather events that have happened in the United States and that have threatened nuclear facilities are tornadoes, hurricanes, wildflowers, flooding, and droughts. No word yet on a plague of locusts or firstborn suns. But wait, there's more! Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. A new federal court filing says that items with high levels of radiation are being stolen from the top-secret Los Alamos National Laboratory on a regular basis. Some of this material is 500 times above the allowable limit of contamination. Just whoop, going out the door. In one of the nearly 76 thefts committed by Los Alamos personnel, a radioactive bandsaw was taken. I love how this report says that the radiation was, quote, well above the allowable limit of 20 disintegrations per minute because the actual amount registered at 100,000 disintegrations per minute. Yeah, that's a little bit higher. Thankfully, the bandsaw was found and brought back to the laboratory along with a garden hose, gloves, a screwdriver set, and conduit, all of which emitted high levels of radiation. The two individuals associated the theft were first brought to a health clinic for decontamination. No word on who decontaminated the health clinic after they left. Or the whereabouts of the materials stolen those other 75 times. And that's why Los Alamos National Laboratory, and most specifically your security force, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. Over to Japan where the news continues to be not good. Fairwinds Energy Education's latest update on the ongoing nuclear catastrophe at Fukushima Daiichi, delivered by Chief Engineer Arnie Gunderson, presents two reports that confirm the direct link of numerous cancers in Japan to the triple meltdown. In a video released by Fairwinds on November 4th, Gunderson states, two reports recently released in Japan one by Japanese medical professionals and the second from Tokyo Power Company, TEPCO, acknowledge that there will be numerous cancers in Japan much greater than normal due to the radioactive discharges from the triple meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi. I believe, as do many of my colleagues, that there will be at least 100,000 and as many as 1 million more cancers in Japan's future as a result of this meltdown. Gunderson goes on to say, The second report received from Japan proves that the incidence of thyroid cancer is approximately 230 times higher than normal in Fukushima prefectures. So what's the bottom line? The cancers already occurring in Japan are just the tip of the iceberg. 
I'm sorry to say that the worst is yet to come. From Fukushima Diary and our friend Iori Mochizuki, on the 30th of October, Kashiwa City's government announced that 112 of 173 children who were tested were diagnosed with thyroid cysts or nodules. The subjects are the children born between 1992 and 2011, and the study was implemented from this past July until September. Kashiwa City is 228 kilometers, or 122 miles, from Fukushima Daiichi. Also from Fukushima Diary, on November 5th, TEPCO announced the retained water in the Reactor 2 building at Fukushima Daiichi was found to be leaking. The leaked water is assumed to be the coolant water leaked from the Reactor 2 vessel and groundwater flowing from the plant building. In total, 7,200,000,000 becquerels of all beta nuclides, which include strontium-90, and over 3 billion with the B becquerels of cesium-134 and 137 are reported to have leaked out. The former Japanese ambassador to Switzerland, Mitsuehi Murata, recently suggested that Japan should stage an honorable retreat, his term, from hosting the 2020 Olympics due to the unpredictable situation at the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. He specifically cited the large number of spent, not really spent as in used up, because every so-called spent fuel rod contains weapons-grade plutonium. And his concern is for the fuel rods suspended in spent fuel pools in reactors 1, 2, and 3, which can't be removed from the damaged reactor buildings due to the high levels of radioactivity surrounding these reactors. But Murata's gravest concern is a number of troubling indications of possible recurring criticality, meaning uncontrolled nuclear chain reactions, in one or more of the reactors at Fukushima. For example, he notes that in December of 2014, both radioactive iodine-131 and tellurium-132 were reported as having been detected in Takasaki City, 130 miles southwest of Fukushima Daiichi. Given the short half-lives of these radioactive particles, their presence could not be the result of the original meltdowns at Fukushima. There has been no explanation yet forthcoming from TEPCO or the Japanese government as to how these radioactive isotopes did show up. So yeah, let's get rid of the Olympics in Tokyo. Move it someplace safe, like on the beach in Australia. And we'll put a link to Ambassador Murata's full letter up on our website under this episode, number 229. Now we look north to Canada where opponents of a proposed nuclear waste dump less than one mile from the shores of Lake Huron are hopeful that a new Canadian government will reject the plan. The election of Canada's new Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has given long-ignored activists as well as cities from around the Great Lakes which have protested hope that this lame-brained scheme can finally be scuttled. Ontario Power Generation wants to bury approximately 200,000 cubic meters of low to medium level nuclear waste, 680 meters, that's just under half a mile, below ground. They insist it's safe, but that's what every nuclear facility says when it comes to burying their waste. Ah, don't worry, you won't see any problems. No, you won't see it, smell it, touch it, taste it, or be able to sense it with any of your senses. But it'll be there. Just do the epidemiology in about 10, 12, 15, 30, 50 years. Here's hoping Trudeau decides in favor of life. But meanwhile, Canada's Nuclear Waste Management Organization has completed the first phase of preliminary assessment for the municipality of Central Huron, as a possible contender for hosting a deep geological repository for the nation's used nuclear fuel. 21 communities in Ontario or Saskatchewan requested preliminary assessments for this depository, which is separate from the one on the shores of Lake Huron. Eleven municipalities are still under consideration, including Blind River, 
Central Huron, Elliot Blake, Horn Payne, Huron Kinloss, Ignace, Manitou Wadge, Schreiber, South Bruce and White River, all in Ontario, and Creighton in Saskatchewan. Here's hoping that Prime Minister Trudeau sinks this one, too. In Australia, Energy Resources Australia, which owns and operates the Ranger uranium mine, defied warnings from authorities and went ahead with what they called was a controlled burn at their site, which just happens to be in the middle of the Kakadu National Park. According to the Northern Territory Fire Service, the controlled burn got out of control and turned into a brush fire, which burned through 200 square kilometers of the Kakadu National Park and threatened heritage-listed and culturally significant sites. Traditional owners warned the mine operator not to do the burn-off and blame Energy Resources Australia, or ERA, for lighting a fire too late in the top end's dry season and losing control of it. They said it was the second year it had happened and accused ERA of negligence. ERA, which is majority owned by Rio Tinto, has said it did not require permission to start the weed management fire on the Ranger Project site. The company is conducting its own investigation into the fire, which I'm sure will just let them off their own hook. They're claiming that on the day they set the fire, there was no fire ban in place, but apparently there was no common sense either. And for all nuclear reactors in all countries everywhere, anonymous insiders reveal real hacking risks to nuclear power plants. A report on the growing cyber risks to nuclear reactors quotes these insiders who reveal a lack of cybersecurity awareness, design flaws, threat actors, cyber attack scenarios, and backbiting among personnel. The report is put out by a new think tank, Chatham House, and we will have a link to it up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 229. We'll have today's featured interview in just a moment. But first, Nuclear Hot Seat, the website, is back up and better than ever. If you haven't yet, go to NuclearHotSeat.com and check out all of our new features, including a way to search by month and by topic. Tis a thing of beauty. And we're making it even prettier as we continue to tweak the content and add links. Many people donated to help make this happen, and we remain grateful to you. However, support is still needed because the show goes on and we have monthly charges. Here's an idea. If you go out and get one of those expensive cups of coffee on a regular basis, why not take the price of that and donate it to us? Make a $5 recurring donation, one a month, to Nuclear Hot Seat. It's like you're buying us a cup of coffee. And in that way, we will have an ongoing income to be able to cover website charges, internet fees, some of the services we use. And in this way, we'll be able to anticipate how much of the expense is being covered by knowing how much we're getting on a monthly basis. And hey, if you want to buy us two cups of coffee or more, that's cool too. You can do this by going to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red donate button, you can either donate through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card, but the recurring can be set up through PayPal. Or if you want to give a donation but don't care to do it online, email me at info at nuclearhotseat.com for a snail mail address where you can send your donation the old-fashioned way. Whatever you do to help this show keep going, thank you so very much. You've got my gratitude. For this week's interview... We have one of my favorite interviewees, Mary Olson. She is director of the Southeast Office for Nuclear Information and Resource Service, known to us as NEARS. Mary is an expert on the impact of radiation on the human body and how it wrecks disproportionately greater havoc on females than males. Be aware that at one point in the interview... I threw an unexpected question at Mary about something that has concerned me for a while regarding genetic vulnerability. Her answer was so stunning 
and my response shows how truly flabbergasted I was, that I've included our ad hoc conversation for you to hear. This interview originally aired on Nuclear Hot Seat number 191 from February 17, 2015. Mary Olson, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. It's great to be here. Mary, you looked at gender as a risk factor for cancer from radiation exposure. Why did you choose to do that? Well, Libby, I have had my job with Nuclear Information and Resource Service since 1991. And in about 2008 or 2009, when I was out giving public talks, I had women asking me in the question and answer period about radiation being more harmful to women. And I was astounded. I'd never heard this. Quite frankly, I asked them, did they mean pregnant women? And they said, no, women. And I kind of stopped in my tracks. And it was the Fukushima disaster in 2011 that forced me to realize I had to track this down. So I did. And I called then icon of the 20th century and my mentor, Dr. Rosalie Bertel. And she was the one who really encouraged me to follow this up and told me I had to get out a pencil and an eraser and go into the data myself. Where did you look for the information? Well, in 2006, the National Academy of Sciences published the seventh report in a series called The Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. And there's always a bad joke because the acronym is pronounced BEER, but it's B-E-I-R, Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. This has been a serious effort at the national level to look at what we know and don't know about radiation. It's been very difficult to feel that it was fair and balanced, but number seven is very interesting report, and it actually printed numbers from the lifespan study, LSS, which is really the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the people who did not get vaporized the days that the bombs fell on those cities, but actually survived, but were exposed to a single blast of gamma rays. And so those people were tracked throughout their lives. Indiana, you mentioned that there are problems with the BEER-7 data. What did you mean? The study didn't start until five years after the bombs were dropped. So many of the people who were most impacted by radiation were already dead when the study started. Therefore, we have a skewed population to begin with. The next problem is that the researchers assumed Well, this is a moral problem more than a research problem, but they assumed that if they gave any medical assistance at all to the people they were studying, that it would skew their results. And so in many respects, we have the results of poverty and loss of infrastructure as impacting health as much as radiation in this body of data. And the third problem is that they totally assumed the only radiation that impacted these people was the event on August 6th and on August 9th, 1945, when atomic bombs were dropped on these populations. They did, however, structure the study in a way that allows us to make some broad generalizations. And that structure was to group people by approximately how much radiation on a reconstructed dose they think they got and how old they were at the time of the bombing. They counted cancers and cancer deaths And that's what was published by the National Academy of Sciences with some other studies thrown in as well. But that's the main body of data and the biggest place that it has been shared where the public can access it relatively easily. And that's what I sat down and did some simple division. They have all these big numbers in big tables, and I reduced them down to the simple ratio of one in so many. One in so many is where you start seeing these ratios pop out. And it turns out that little girls are twice as likely to get cancer at some point in their lives if they're exposed between the age of birth and five years old than little boys in the same age group and the same exposure level. Half the rate of cancer at some point in their lives for boys compared to girls. What have you discovered might be the reason behind this differential between boys and girls? 
Well, the interesting thing is that the National Academy of Science, it, with their large panel of many scientists and lots of peer review, don't even mention gender as a risk factor. And I still don't know, and honestly, I should someday ask whether they saw it and just decided not to say anything, or if they just plain missed it. The same findings were published by Dr. Arjun Makajani in 2006 under his campaign, Healthy from the Start. He's with the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, but I had no awareness of his paper. Now, both of us are just talking about patterns in numbers of large numbers of people exposed to a very special situation, which was the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Where does it go from there? We have not seen another real study on this question, let alone an explanation, which is what you're asking me. So, no, there is no place I can point to that says this is why. But one possibility would be a different ratio of fat tissue, and Dr. Rosalie, my mentor, mentioned disproportionate amount of reproductive tissue, which we know to be more reactive to radiation exposure. The female body, even when it's a juvenile, has more radiosensitive reproductive cells than do boys. Now, boys get sick. We can't act like it's okay for boys to be exposed. Boys get cancer, boys die from it at some point in their lives after being exposed, but at less of a rate than do girls. Girls are twice as likely. Do we know why this is the case? No, we don't know why. And we have a rising generation of professionals who I hope will tackle it because this is really important. Now, Dr. Rosalie Bertel had a suggestion. She says that reproductive tissue is hot tissue in terms of being vulnerable to damage from ionizing radiation exposure and that female bodies have probably roughly 50% more reproductive tissue if you can include the mammary areas and the uterus. That's one hypothesis. But we do know very clearly that there's a lot of metabolic and biochemical differences based on gender and it's quite possible that there's something in addition. I want to unfold one more piece, and that is that the lifespan study of Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors show that when the radiation exposure happened as adults, in other words, in 1945, the individual in question, both male and female, were adults, over the rest of their lifespans, women got 50% more cancer. So for every two men who got cancer in the lifespan study if they were exposed as adults, three women got cancer. So I still think that's very significant. It's not quite as high a difference as in the childhood case, but it's there. And something that every woman has a right to know. One of the things that I have wondered about, when a little girl is born, she already has inside of herself all of the eggs she will ever have for her entire life. So in essence, we are all the genetic offspring of our father and our maternal grandmother because that's whose body formed the eggs. Is it possible that the presence of these eggs from birth in little girls might have some impact or something to do with the fact that females are more at risk from exposure to radiation? Maybe you've put your hammer on the head of a nail that's extremely important in our discussion of the environmental impacts of radiation. However, I do not believe the fact that our eggs as females are formed in our grandmother's body is a risk factor. It's the opposite. The fact that our grandmother's bodies contribute the mitochondria and all the non-DNA portions of the egg right? I mean, once you're an embryo, you're a combination of the DNA in that egg plus the father's sperm, as you pointed out. It's a combination of the grandmother and the father genetically. But it's also a protective feature of the impacts of environment on the human species. There was a lot of confidence in the male policy, and I'm, I'm using that term because in the 1950s and 60s, our policy structure was almost exclusively male, and today it is still two-thirds or more male. So in a gender conversation, we need to point that out. 
those policy guys felt very confident about nuclear technology because there was not a big bump up in cancer as soon as they started testing nuclear weapons. And they knew there was fallout going nationwide. The thing they didn't factor is that you don't get atomic eggs for two generations. And by atomic eggs, I mean the egg cell was made in a body that was being directly affected by radioactivity in the environment. And so that is why, in my view, the big cancer epidemic lagged behind the dawn of the atomic age because it took two generations to get atomic eggs. That was my theory. I wanted to set you up to be able to talk about it, but I've been wondering about this, and I'm no geneticist. It just struck me. This part is not going to be in the interview. Well, the part about the atomic eggs can be because Dr. Arjun Makajani started going around saying he was 90 years old because he understood damn well what I was saying when I brought this up in a, a discussion with him. Um, Oh, no, 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 the information, I mean, the information yeah. about the eggs, so, I think I mean, that is crucial to our understanding. Arjun, Arjun loves to say he's 90 years old and then explain why, because he, he understood the significance of the fact that the men and women of 1945 and 1960 were the product of eggs that were formed at least 20 years earlier. So, Meaning before the start of the atomic age. Exactly. So you, you don't get atomic eggs until you have the great-grandchildren. I'm, I, I, I'm just stunned to finally hear a confirmation of this. This is, uh, it, it's, it's bad news, but great information. The field that is going to tackle the questions of how ionizing radiation impacts our bodies and potentially why there's a gender link to the risk for cancer is the field of epigenetics. Yes, genetics is involved. Yes, genetics is intimately involved in the induction of cancer. But the epigenetics, meaning how those genetic instructions are translated out into the cell, all the operations of the cell that access the DNA in the first place, all of that's called epigenetics. And that is the field, I believe, that will start unraveling some of these mysteries. But there's a whole lot that has been excluded from radiation protection in the sense of the field of health physics, in the sense of federal development of radiation, quote unquote, protection standards. You have to understand that all of it is rooted in the production of these same bombs. And when there were just a few places in the whole world that had concentrated radioactivity, and you were sending military and paramilitary males into those places, those places being Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they were enriching the uranium, the very few uranium mines that had been developed. The only test site was in New Mexico at Trinity, et cetera, et cetera. These were very limited places that were highly radioactive. You had standards based on exposing young male bodies, and that was the standard reference man. We now know that you cannot meet a one in a million standard for a little girl, which socially we say industrial activities, well, if it causes one cancer in a million, okay. And it was super fun. They had to back off of that. It was too hard. They would cause one cancer in 100,000. In a few cases, maybe one cancer in 10,000 exposed. These are the risk factors that our federal government considers allowable. Well, our current radiation standards for adult males allow a risk factor of 1 in 286 people exposed, way below. That's the 100 millirem a year, okay? That's like not even the Fukushima devastating criminal increase to 2 rems or 2,000 millirems a year that they're allowing at Fukushima. That's the 100 millirems a year is a risk factor for 1 in 286. That's not Dr. Rosalie's numbers. That's not Dr. John Goffman's numbers. That is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's own numbers. So if you take those numbers and multiply by the risk factors that you'd have to adopt in order to protect little girls, you can't do it. You have to be closing facilities down and cleaning up. The coefficient has to be negative in order to protect little girls. So basically, we now have the ability to stand up and say that the nuclear complex is incompatible with the future of our species because 
I'm on a tirade, but the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, was going to revise the radiation standards, and I brought up little girls, and they said something about a subpopulation. I said, dear, little girls are not a subpopulation. Little girls in Chicago are a subpopulation, but little girls are integral to the life cycle of our species. And they stopped. They said, oh, you're right. But this is a male leader in our EPA at the federal level going to rewrite a radiation standard as if a little girl is a subpopulation. It pisses me off. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not usually stunned when it comes to figuring out the next question I'm going to ask, but, man, you did it to me with that one. It is such a lethal blind spot for our species. Yes. We've known that the nuclear future is no future. We've known this. And so I wrapped up my talk to the 158 country delegations in Vienna, Austria, on their consideration of the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons in December, where I was. I said, look, we talk about nuclear war, we say there is no cure, only prevention. And I turned around and said, prevention is the cure. You know, the whole precautionary principle thing didn't catch on really far, and part of that is because we are innovators, we are experimenters, and if you take precaution, you can't do anything. But this isn't about innovation or, or experimentation. We know. The data is in. National Academy of Sciences published it. All I did was take a pencil and an eraser and do the math to find out, well, what's the gender factor? And the gender factor is very bad news. And so now it's time to say the experiment is over and prevention is the cure, and now we have to stop and clean up and contain, and, you know, we still have a possibility of making it. But if we don't stop, look, and listen now, we're well over the cliff. How was this information received when you offered it in Vienna and in other conferences and experiences where you had the chance to get it in front of people who maybe could do something about it? You know, Libby, I'm just starting. I published the paper in 2011, and then I stepped back in part because they started wanting to build new nuclear power plants, and it seemed more valuable use of my time to just go ahead and try and stop those. And happily, we have pretty much scrubbed the next generation through the efforts of many different organizations, including Nuclear Information Resource Service. The next generation of nuclear reactors is pretty much on hold and putting itself in the ditch as we speak. It's a retirement party, not a renaissance. So that was good. But now it's bugging me. People have a right to know. Parents have a right to know that their little girls are twice at risk as our little boys. And one of the things that's difficult, of course, is that right now the known exposures are mostly medical. And I don't want to attack any type of medicine for anybody, but I still think people have a right to know, and especially since those occupational workplaces are dominated by female employees. Have they been told? I don't think so. And so I'm sort of getting back in the track, and certainly this invitation to speak in Vienna was a great opportunity to frame it. But again, the other difficulty is the, the data is thin. We have the largest data set in the world on ionizing radiation exposure with a long lifespan study, but we have no idea, no idea about places like Chernobyl or Fukushima or Marshall Islands or any of the places where people have been living in the soup of the radioactivity. Is it the same? We don't know. But this is closer to an X-ray, an external exposure of gamma rays is closer to an X-ray. So the medical context, the aviation context, people who fly a lot, do women think about this? They don't even know about it. Where are you taking this information next? Are you going on the road? Are you doing a series of speaking engagements? Are you open to being booked for speaking engagements? I go where I'm invited. Um, we don't have a lot of funding right now for going on the road. There is a bit of a stirring in the southeastern United States where I live and work to try and reach out uh, a little more broadly to get this information out. I would love to talk to people in organized labor, people in health and health education. There's more questions than there are answers, but we should be asking those questions and we should be pushing each other to get the answers. 
I can't imagine that mommy and me groups or grandmother groups would not be shocked, horrified, and motivated to put some energy into getting this information out into the world because women are the ones who are connected with childbirth and that life cycle most intimately. Yes. And they would be, I think, some really good targets for this. So my appeal is out to the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. If you are in a group, if you know a group, healthcare, unions, moms, grandmoms, anything at all that might be able to benefit from hearing Mary talk about this to raise the awareness, would you please get in touch? And what's the best way to contact you about this? My email is maryo at nirs.org. That's Nuclear Information and Resource Service dot organization. We have a website, www.nirs.org. There's a contact us frame on that website. You can reach me that way. And if there's any response at all, I'll be inspired to put up a little crowdsource fundraising page to help with raising funds for travel because I basically have no program budget at all. I do have my time, and I am available, and I want people to have this information to be able to make their own choices because government protecting us is a long way off. And if people wish to read any of your writing on this subject or take a look at a video of you speaking about it, where could they gain access to that? Go to nears.org. Then on the left side, there's a link that says radiation. Press that, and when you get to that page, at the top, there's another link on the left side that says health effects. And the health effects page is all about the gender link in terms of risk factor for cancer from radiation exposure. And again, this is one study that talks about a single external exposure of gamma radiation, which is a lot like x-rays, across a whole population of people of different ages and then tracking them over their lifetime, we don't actually know a whole lot more about real life, like what if you live where there's contamination in the water. We don't know about that, and we're not going to know about it because nobody's funding the kind of epidemiological work it would take to find out. And why is that? Because the nuclear industry is major donors to the people who make those decisions. And as we are all learning in the age of money is speech, (laughs) we have to speak up. So here's looking to get some dollars together for you to, at minimum, fund a speaking tour and a major PR push because I cannot imagine that if people knew this information, especially women knew this information, They would not be in the streets demonstrating, contacting legislators, and demanding that this nuclear juggernaut be derailed, turned around, and flattened as best possible. So we have a possibility of a future for the human species. Thank you, Libby, so much for giving me this opportunity to connect to your already active group of people. And I hear your partnership in this moment, and I look forward to it more in the future. And I welcome anybody listening, reaching out and bringing about the wonderful image you have. Again, a gender-based comment. I love men. I love their view of the world. I know that because they are in the policy seat, money matters. But quite frankly, women don't really care that much about money. We care about our babies. And this is all about the babies. So thank you. Thank you for the work that you are doing for this terrifying hit of information and for sharing it as graciously and as thoroughly as you just have with the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. That was Mary Olson of NEARS. She can be reached at nears.org. And on December 8, Mary will participate via Skype in the 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference taking place in Paris. At that time, she will talk about radiation and its disproportionate impact in relation to gender. Here is the week's radiation safeguarding tip from RAPT, Radiation Awareness Protection Talk. 
This is especially key for our friends in North St. Louis who are dealing with the radioactive waste at the Westlake landfill and the fumes from the underground fire. If you do not yet have a HEPA air filter for your home, get one. Better yet, get several. Place them in your bedrooms and in any room that has a door that opens to the outside. HEPA filters take particles out of the air and have been known to filter out radiation. That's why in cleaning the filters, you need to do so very carefully. Go outside and take safety measures. Wear disposable gloves and a mask. Dump the filtered dust onto multiple thicknesses of newspaper and then immediately roll up and put in multiple plastic bags, tie knots in each one of them, and dispose of the resulting package as you would toxic materials. Get rid of your gloves and mask too. No reusing them. Not allowed. If you want more information on best practices to help safeguard from radiation, Radiation Awareness Protection Talk, or RAPT, is a six-audio series on best possible practices for safeguarding health against the ravages of nuclear radiation. It was put together by myself and certified nutrition educator Kimberly Roberson, who is also the founder of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. RAPT is an extensive compilation of vetted, footnoted, verifiable information on how to best take care of yourself and your loved ones when facing a nuclear crisis. To get the RAPT program, and a lot of free information as well, go to raptawareness.com. That's R-A-P like Peter, T like Tom, awareness.com. Note that to help support our friends in St. Louis, we have reduced the price on RAPT through Sunday, November 15. Activist shout out. Nuclear Energy Information Service, or NEIS, in Chicago, hosted the first training session of the newly formed Radiation Monitoring Project. It took place in Chicago on October 30th. Nuclear researcher Lucas Hickson of Informable Environmental Services of Michigan conducted an intensive training for 10 eager trainees on the topics of radiation and the field use of monitors. After five hours of information, they spent three hours hands-on using monitors provided by the project to take readings on selected radioactive samples provided by Hickson. The Chicago event was the first of what will be a series of trainings around the country, sponsored by Radiation Monitoring Project. The next trainings are tentatively slated to be held in Chicago sometime in January. This would be good for any of you from St. Louis, and also in Albuquerque in March of 2016. You can learn more about this at neis.org. And I want to use this show to cover aspects of what's happening in and around St. Louis in a way that is going to be useful to those of you who live down there to get you the information you both want and need. So if you live in that area and have specific issues or questions you would like covered, please send me an email at info at nuclearhotseat.com. Your guidance will help me better cover what you're up against, what can be done, and what's being done, if anything. Here's today's final thought. And again, my mind has never been far away from the people of North St. Louis and in proximity with the Westlake landfill. If those of you living there are hoping for an executive order or declaration of emergency from President Obama to address the disaster that is Westlake and Coldwater Creek, I think this week's nuclear summit at the White House goes a long way towards explaining why you're not going to get any help from that quarter. There will be no top-down leadership on this to assist you. That's because the president's largest donors, going back to his first campaign for the White House, are part of the nuclear industry. Thus, it's no accident that one of his first acts upon gaining the presidency was to guarantee $12.5 billion in federal loans and push forward the construction of two new nuclear reactors at Bogle in Georgia. Now, with this latest summit, he's gone out on that pro-nuclear-is-green limb and paid back more of what he owes to his nuke-based supporters. And, of course, 
the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Department of Energy are falling into lockstep behind him to support new nukes and current reactors being licensed for another 20 years when they were all supposed to be built to last for only 40 years. Think of that in terms of your car. Would you trust a 40-year-old car to be relicensed for another 20? I don't think so. That is why you're not getting more coverage in the national media, and that is why the White House will not respond to your demands. Mark my words on this. I remember as a kid being told, you have to clean up the mess in your room before you can go out and play with your toys. I didn't like it, but I had to do it because, hey, if you knew my mom, you'd understand. So where's that stern mother in this administration who's going to tell the nuclear industry that they have to clean up their mess, landfill dumps, radioactive waste, so-called spent fuel rods and assemblies currently stored on-site at operating and closed reactors around the country, and so much more, that they have to clean all of that up before they're allowed to go tout themselves as green and go rushing out to build more reactors. I don't see anyone anywhere in this administration who's got the ovaries to do this. So, moms, you've heard the risks you face from radiation in today's interview with Mary Olson. We cannot rely on the men in power or their female clones like EPA head Gina never met a nuke I didn't like in cover for McCarthy to step forward on your behalf. It's going to take grassroots mom power and those who support the moms to get on your local politicians, mayors, state representatives, and senators to say nothing of your local media to force a declaration of a state of emergency. Not easy. Not fun. But you know, I'm betting on the moms to accomplish what our compromised top elected leadership either can't or won't. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, November 10, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, washingtonexaminer.com, snl.com, ocregister.com, santafeinewmexican.com, albuquerquejournal.com, kiontv, Erica Gray for her weekly reactor news updates, timesfreepress.com, beyondnuclear.org, capecodtimes.com, sputniknews.com, fairwindsenergyeducation.org, and the esteemed Arnie Gunderson, fukushimadiary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, japantimes.com, michiganradio.org, theguardian.com slash Australia, computerworld.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Jern School Dropouts Who Write for World Nuclear News, and the magnificent, sterling, fabulous activists of the Nuclear Hot Seat community on Facebook, which you are all invited to like. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompanied by John Barnard, as recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and StuWebRadioNetwork.com, formerly Veterans Truth Network. The show is also available on iTunes under podcasts. The archive is available on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. 
It's the bomb.